you can count when you're happy. One, two, three, four, you can count when you're sad. One, two, three, four, five, or count when you're frightened. One, two, three, four, five, six, count when you're mad. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ah, count. Counting is wonderful, counting is marvelous, counting's terrific and how... Finally, we reached the season finale, the culmination of a lot of plot threads that have been building over, well, mostly the last three or four episodes. The episode opens with a big reveal for Lex that affects everybody. Lionel Luther is closing the fertilizer plant and laying off all 2,500 employees, all because he wants Lex back in Metropolis, as he's been plotting and scheming to make happen for a while now. Lex attempts an employee buyout, putting up all of his capital and asking his employees to mortgage their homes and cash in their retirements to force a vote of Luther Corp's board. One of those employees, of course, is Chloe's father, and now she's in danger of having to move out of Smallville. Her whole life turned upside down, her one comfort is that Clark is finally giving her a chance and taking her to the spring formal, alleviating her fear that he'll run off for Lana by uncharacteristically saying exactly the right thing when he says, I'm going to the dance with you not by default, but because I want to. Meanwhile, Whitney's My Father Just Died subplot wraps up with his telling Lana, who is still unsure if she wants to stay with him, that he's enlisted in the Marine Corps. Of course, he asks his ninth grade girlfriend if she'll wait for him, and she's completely speechless. But he follows that melodramatic, not-so-mature request with a surprisingly very mature request when he asks Clark, whom at the beginning of the season he strung up in a field, to look out for Lana while he's gone. As Whitney decides to grow up and try to make something of his life, Lana ultimately doesn't break up with them, instead drawing out their goodbye and crying her head off while driving in the worst storm anyone's ever seen, ever. And it's also time for Roger Nixon to make his big play, blowing up a truck with Clark in it to confirm that Clark's indestructible. He also figures out that Clark's an alien and exactly where his spaceship is, wiretapping the Kent's house and listening into their conversations. He steals the Kryptonian key from Lex and, during the storm, goes into the Kent cellar with a camera to prove his findings, exploit Clark, and become, as he puts it, filthy rich. Jonathan finds him there, punches him in the face, and chases him outside, leaving Martha with the glowing spaceship that's just sprung to life after Nixon put the key in it. Way to look out for your wife's well-being, Jonathan. Spaceship you know almost nothing about is hovering in midair, lit up like a Christmas tree. What could possibly go wrong? Instead of a cryptofreak this episode, the big threat is Kansas weather, which actually, oddly, makes a fair amount of sense, given that tornadoes are a real problem in that area, and I should know. I live in Kansas, actually pretty close to where Smallville most likely is, and we've had some small towns completely ravaged in my lifetime, like Hoisington and Greensburg. Hoisington, in fact, was in April of 2001, just the previous year, and they seem to happen this time of year, too, so it's not so far-fetched that this particular cliffhanger happens right at the end of a season, whereas as later on, it gets a little suspicious that every major event culminates in a giant death trap for nearly every character in May of every year. Anyway, the tornado doesn't get its own character arc like other big deadly threats usually do since it's you know, a tornado, but it looms in the background from the teaser through the whole episode until it strikes right at the end and threatens to kill Lana. Also during the storm, Lionel shows up at Lex's mansion, having discovered that Lex's trump card is to use his mother's stock to fund the buyout, and he blows up, swearing that he'll, quote, bury Lex and anyone who takes his side. When a sharp wooden beam falls from the ceiling, just inches from Lionel's face, Lionel, who's buried under rubble, a bleeding but free Lex watches, realizing that this is his moment to find finally be free of his father. The one thing he just expressed only a moment before was all he wanted in the world. And of course, we'll have to wait until next season to see just what he does. Just before the screen says to be continued, we see Lana in Whitney's truck getting sucked up into the tornado and Clark running up inside of it to rescue her. Then credits. There's a lot going on in this episode, and most of it's quite good. This is by far the most thoughtfully constructed story of the season, getting completely away from the regular formula and simply allowing its characters to propel the plot along. No media rock, no crypto freaks, no bullet time, no convenient unconsciousness, and all of that is replaced with some actual, not entirely predictable storytelling. I can't say that I'm super invested in this Clark, Lana, Chloe love triangle and this spring formal subplot, but I find that Chloe and Clark actually have a bit of a spark together. 
I can actually kind of see what he might see in Chloe, whereas his fascination with Lana continues to seem completely physical, and it's kind of glaring that he hasn't considered forgetting about Lana in favor of Chloe a lot earlier than this. And Lana is, for the most part, pretty gracious seeing the two of them together, with the exception of the token catch the other two at the precise moment they're kissing for all of five seconds when you just happen to be walking down the hall scene, because it wouldn't be Smallville without at least one brief moment of love triangle face. But while Clark, for the most part, isn't acting obnoxious this episode like he has been, the exceptional part is Lex, who's what this story is really about. Sure, Clark's having to deal with being tracked and potentially exploited by Nixon like he was by Fainlin, and I love that Fainlin gets a mention, by the way, but his part in all of this so far is completely passive. It's Lex who really wants something, has that moment where he has a chance to risk huge consequences to get what he wants, and since this is a cliffhanger, we don't get to see what that choice is or its results until later. I'm reviewing this on its own, of course, so I won't talk about what Lex chooses to do and what I think of that until we get into, you know, the rest of this story, but what a brilliant, brilliant setup. Here's a guy who spent all season trying to better himself while unintentionally and simultaneously proving just how much like his father he is at every turn, the way he manipulated the Hardwicks into losing their fortune, and the way he's continued to investigate Smallville and the Kents while trying to deceive the Kents into believing his intentions are completely noble. Now his dad closes his business and lays off 2,500 people, despite its being profitable and his finally starting to build a good reputation in the town, and most importantly, despite seeing Smallville as a place that he can be happy and be a better person. It's like watching a supervillain force his son into becoming a supervillain. He's afraid either that Lex is becoming so much like him that he's going to be a threat to him, or that he's learning a different way, something other than being that scheming tyrant Lionel always raised him to be, and that makes him unpredictable. Either way, he's becoming something Lionel can't control, on top of some huge secret Lionel doesn't want him to discover before he dies. I love their plotting against each other and how good at it they both are. And at the end of the episode, we see Lionel truly surprised by the way his son sees him. I'm not your enemy, I'm your father. Lex responds with, I've never seen the distinction. And given how he plots behind his son's back and tries to manipulate him, neither really has Lionel. As he lies there inches away from death, you can see in Lionel's eyes that he realizes he's trained his son too well. He's raised him to be ruthless, to do whatever it takes to get what you want, no matter who stands in your way. He's just got through telling Lex that that's what he would do. Regardless of it being his son, he's willing to destroy him just for defying him. And now, if he chooses to take the opportunity, it's Lex's turn to do that very thing. Lex's situation with his father opens a great opportunity to foreshadow Clark and Lex's eventual rift, and it takes it when Lex says that his relationship with his father is built on lies and deceit. Any relationship built on that foundation is doomed to fail. Good thing we don't have that problem, Lex says, and Clark nervously responds with, lucky us. Lex is scared to death he's going down the same path as his father, and he sees Clark as his one chance to still turn that around. Clark isn't completely sure he can trust him, though he's really trying, giving him the benefit of the doubt earlier in the episode that the plant closing wasn't Lex's doing. And what's sadly ironic is that becoming his father is precisely what he has to do to be rid of him. And also, Roger Nixon claims he has proof that there really is something hugely unusual about Clark, and so to discover what that is, Lex would have to forget about his friendship with Clark and, again, become his father. He has a chance to satiate his curiosity, but that would trap him down a dark and terrible path. And at the end, he has a chance to free himself from his father, but that would trap him in exactly the same way. It's sad, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderfully layered. The opening scene is awesomely symbolic of how Lex feels about his father, looking up at him in a helicopter. His father has always been above him, greater than him, a legend who lords over his empire while Lex struggles to prove himself worthy of his father's love, all the way wanting to be a better man than his father. This is one of the most appropriate uses also of popular music in the entire series, What Do I Have to Do by Stabbing Westward. As we watch Lionel trying to destroy everything his son has built, his father who should be proud of him but instead hates him for not subordinating himself to him, we hear these lyrics. If I can't make you love me, tell me, what do I have to do? It really doesn't get any better than this episode for the Luthers. The storm is used, as Smallville often does with its themes, cold, heat, bugs, etc., as a figurative descriptor of all the storms that have been brewing these last few episodes and are about to finally begin, which doesn't feel as forced as it could have since everyone knows there's a storm coming. It's a little more natural to make storm allegories when you actually know there's a storm coming and you have storms on the brain. 
As I said, I think Clark is mostly pretty mature this episode. He genuinely seems to be trying to give Chloe the magical evening with him she's been craving, and whether he really thinks he could fall for like she has for him. I have a lot of respect for him for being selfless enough to do this for his friend. It doesn't really feel like he's stringing her along either, even when he kisses her. He's making no promises that it'll get serious, just that he's giving her a shot, and he really seems to mean it. This is all in the wake of Whitney leaving town, and so, as Chloe points out, Lana's about to be a free agent, and still, he gives Chloe a chance. What I don't like is in the middle of all this, he has an extremely awkward moment with Whitney, which I don't think was fair. I may not really like Whitney, but he's really shaped up this episode. He apologizes for what happened earlier in the year and recognizes everything Clark has done for Lana. He then asks Clark to watch out for Lana while he's gone, proving that he trusts him. Now, sure, it would be weird for Clark hearing Whitney say, I asked her to wait for me, so I get that he's not sure what to say to that. But what's so hard about saying yes or of course to look out for while I'm gone? He practically blows him off. He's really noncommittal about it. Maybe this would have been a stranger request in the real world, but keep in mind, this is Smallville we're talking about. It's not a macho thing here, like, oh, my girlfriend can't take care of herself and I need you to promise you'll watch out for her so I know you'll feel guilty and therefore won't actually date her behind my back. I really think this is Whitney recognizing that, though he doesn't understand it, Clark's got this gift for saving people's lives, really cares about Lana, and Lana has really bad luck when it comes to stalkers and explosions, and every time something like that has happened, it's been Clark who saved the day. Clark technically agrees to it, but he doesn't do much to reassure Whitney, and I don't think it's the script, I think it's Tom Welling's delivery. Call it a quibble, but I took it as a pretty jerky thing to do. And though I feel myself actually half liking Whitney for the first time ever, the scene at the bus station goes on long enough, it goes from tender to melodramatic. When they're in the truck, I'm with them. It's a sad moment. Whitney is proving that he can be a hero like Clark, and she's realizing that maybe she already has what she wants without Clark, but for him to go be a hero, he has to go away from her. But when she gets out of the truck, runs over to him, and we get this nauseating dialogue like Whitney's, I've loved you from the moment I saw you, and I'll still love you when I see you again, that's all going a little too far for me. I'm a little confused about the spring formal. Isn't this around the same time as prom should be? Wouldn't Whitney be going to prom? Or is this a little earlier in the year? If he's shipping out, is he not graduating high school with his class? I'm confused. And for a spring formal, this thing looks like a prom. Heck, it's a lot more elaborate than my prom was. And it's not even a prom. They even got Remy Zero. Obviously, just to have the band play the theme song of the show like these series often seem to do. A Seventh Heaven did it, Buffy did it, but really, a town that small got Remy Zero to play at their high school? For a formal? How is it that a truck explodes on a farm and it doesn't at least make the local news? Lex hasn't heard when it comes up at the Talon, and when Clark asks Chloe to drive him to the formal all nonchalant about it, he just says, my transportation kind of went up in flames, and she has no idea what he's talking about. Maybe the people of Smallville are just so used to all these explosions by now, <laughs> it's just not even newsworthy anymore. And here's the big super silly thing. Remember how shallow and brainless I've often thought Lana is? Well, here she totally proves it when she sees three tornadoes coming toward her come together to become one giant mega tornado. She's parked right next to a freaking ditch and she gets back in the truck. She gets back in the truck! She's lived in Kansas her entire life. Clark has a line earlier where he says, storms are a way of life around here, and that's more or less true. So shouldn't she know what to do in a tornado? There's a ditch she could crawl into right there. And this time, I'm not saying Lana should crawl into a ditch the normal way I usually say Lana should crawl into a ditch. This time, it would actually maybe save her life. What a moron. I somewhat question just how big a deal the plant closing really is, as Jonathan's figures don't exactly match the population sign. Jonathan says it's Smallville's biggest employer, which I might somewhat question in a town of 45,000 people, and then he totally confirms this is completely ridiculous when he claims that's, quote, half of the town's jobs. Half? 2,500 is only about 6% of 45,000, so unless the town is completely overrun by children, 
I've been complaining about the sign all season, and this totally clinches it. It has an extra zero. That's got to be it, right? Because 2,500 is just over 50% of 4,500, so in that case, Jonathan's statement would make perfect sense. Naturally, this is all going to fall apart later on when other things, like a train station, will make the town feel a whole lot more like 45,000 or even more, but at least right now, i got to wonder if it's Smallville's local government or Smallville's producers that can't do math. And things to ask Jarrell when I get to heaven. Is this some kind of cryptofreak tornado? Triple tornadoes are pretty rare, and I suppose it's possible if they were all in the same place at once, they might combine into one giant tornado. But it seems a little coincidental that it did it right out in front of Lana when she's the only one around. We know that some crypto freaks seem to have an overwhelming, irrational obsession with and then homicidal desire to kill Lana, so I wonder if there's kryptonite in that tornado and if Lana is magnetic like a trailer park. I think the triple tornado thing is totally overkill unless it is kryptonite induced. You're in Kansas. A tornado makes sense. Why does it have to be a huge Ultra F5 Plus tornado? And now let's jump to the scoreboard. Well, there's hardly anything to count this episode, which is usually the mark of a really good one. There is one car crash, that's Lana's truck before the tornado, and there's one instance of a rude super speed exit when Clark runs out of the dance to find Lana when the twisters are announced. And that's it! Despite the few problems I have with this episode, which are comparatively minor and mostly just amusing contradictions, really, I'm going to give Tempest a 4 out of 4. A really effective cliffhanger that finally makes this place feel like a real small Kansas town that gives us a performance from Michael Rosenbaum that's perhaps matched in later episodes but never bested and is totally driven by its characters rather than a set formula. Was there anything I missed in any category? Leave me a personal message on Geekvolution and I'll be sure to add it to the count. Next time we'll be doing a Season 1 overview and a complete season count. I'm Captain Logan, and consider this episode counted. Ah!